Amen. Thank you, Barbara. Hello, everybody. Uh, good to see you this morning. Um, I, uh, before we uh, get started, I want to say just a word about um, our capital campaign. As you know, we're right in the middle of um, this series on perseverance, finishing strong. And we're talking about finishing strong like perseverance, but we're also talking about finishing strong with regard to that campaign. Um, uh, this, uh, I, we are excited to be able to show you a, a picture of the community center. Um, but uh, it is a, an exciting um, time in the life of the church. We said last time that we were right at 19 million and that we, our goal is 23 million uh, pledges over three years. Uh, last week we had some great contributions or, or commitments, and so we're right at 20 million now, which is exciting. So that's a, a <laughs> growth. We're going to keep finishing strong. Um, I hope you'll go on the website later and look at the new uh, picture of the community center um, that is, is going to be there, uh, because it, it really is. Look, in, in 2013, we had a campaign here and raised just short of $40 million, most of which was spent on this campus on, for, on ourselves, honestly, and on our families and on the kids around us. And, but the DNA of St. Luke's is to be about the business of reaching our, our community and to reach out beyond ourselves. And so we'll be building this community center has a student ministry building just almost exactly like the one that we built here for uh, students on this campus. And um, we think it'll make a, a huge difference. So I pray that you will consider it and think about it and uh, see what God may be calling you to do to support this, uh, this campaign. If we all do it, if we all come together, uh, if, if we can do this. Let's pray. Gracious God, open us up. Open our eyes that we might see and our ears that we might hear. Open our hearts that we might feel. And then, O oh Lord, open our hands that we might serve. Amen. The Tour de France is the uh, premier uh, men's bicycling race in the world. It was founded in 1903. It's been run every year, um, except for during World War I and World War II, when France was um, occupied. Um, it is uh, 21 stages uh, over 23 days. It is uh, 2,200 miles through the Pyrenees, through the Alps, through uh, mostly in France, not always in France, not completely in France all the time. Um, as you probably know, the winner, the leader uh, in the Tour de France wears a yellow jersey. So it's a, there's points on each day's race, each stage, and the, the combined point leader wears a yellow jersey. And then there is a green jersey, and the green jersey is for the sprinter. So whoever, it's, the, it, it's not exactly who won the stage that day, but it is, most of the time, it is who happened to win a particular stage of the race. Um, and then there is a white jersey. The white jersey is for those, uh, the, the best rider under the age of 26, the best young rider. My favorite, though, is the polka dot jersey white red polka dots and it is the winner of the mountain stage right the one who has been uh, on each of the mountain stages and there are a number of them throughout the race the one who has had the best time on those mountain stages one of the the iconic mountains in on the on the race is um, mount vivo and uh, Mount Vivo, it's, it's not every year, but many years it's there, and it is awful. It is uh, a, about halfway up, the vegetation goes away, and the heat rises. Uh, it is often as high as 55 degrees uh, centigrade, so that's, that's very high. Uh, the winds are 60 miles an hour. And uh, here's what um, one of the... Uh, cyclists says about it. The air is dry and scarce. The crosswinds can have you leaning your bike just to stay on two wheels. And the heat reflects off the merciless rocks. A cyclist should not fear the gradient, the heat, or the wind. He or she should fear the combination of all three. In a race, tactics are minimal here. By the last few kilometers, toward the aptly named Storm Pass, 
There is only road, white rock, wind, and pain. So the rider who wears the polka dot jersey is aptly named King of the Mountains. King of the Mountains. I, um, we're going to face hard times in our lives. All of us are going to face mountains. Really, and sometimes it feels like the only thing there is wind and pain. And how do we get through those times? One of my favorite illustrations, sermon illustrations, I think it probably is my favorite sermon illustration, and I reserve the right to use it every five years at least, uh, maybe every three. It goes this way. A man from New York is traveling through the South. He comes into Tupelo, Mississippi, and when he gets into Tupelo, Mississippi, he stops for breakfast at a diner. He goes in the diner, and he orders, uh, gives his order to the waitress. He says, I want eggs and bacon and toast, and she says, well, Kyle, how do you want your eggs? He said, over easy, and so she says, yes, sir, and she comes back and she brings him his, his meal and it's, uh, he's got on their eggs and he's got the bacon, he's got the toast and he's got this white grainy stuff and it's got yellow butter floating in the top of it and he says, ma'am, what's that stuff? And she says, that's grits. And he says, grits? I didn't order grits. And he, she said, oh, honey, uh, you don't order grits, grits just comes. <laughs> you don't order hard times. You don't look for them, you don't lean for them, you don't search for them, but grits just comes. What can we learn from the kings of the mountains? From those people who face and master and struggle through the hard times? Well, I, I want to just lift up four things for you. Here's the first one. Kings of the mountains realize they can do more than they thought they could do. That they can do more than they thought they could do. It isn't the case that Paul is telling people, the scripture says rejoice in, the, in, in your uh, sufferings. That isn't, uh, that isn't what Paul is uh, trying to say. Instead, what, he, what he's trying to say is that you, you can count on God throughout them. But you've got to... You've got to face them. You've got to go through them. It, you know, if I was riding, I would think to myself, um, I think I'll look for a flat spot to ride, right? But there's not a flat spot. Uh, when we were, when we were um, uh, play, talking about this in our worship team, some of our young people, like Ju uh, Julie Ellerbrock and Michelle, launched into going on a bear hunt, right? You heard it in the children's sermon, going on a bear hunt. And I, I, I had frankly didn't know that song. I'm not a campfire girl. But uh, uh, nonetheless, you can't go around it. You can't go under it. You've got to go through it. You've got to go through the hard times. When, when, when Paul says, I rejoice, the word, here it says, I boast in my sufferings. It is, it's a very interesting word. It's been translated so many different ways. Um, some say, I rejoice in my sufferings. This one says, I boast in my sufferings. The old King James said, I glory in my sufferings. The, uh, the Greek word here is kalkata uh, mahi. Kalkata mahi. And it literally means holding your head up with your neck. What it's saying is, when I go through hard times, I can hold my head up high. I can keep my strength up through these difficult times because God will get me through. I find it so interesting that people say, uh, somebody goes through a really difficult time, and we say to them, oh, I don't know how you are going through this. I don't know how you, I don't know how you do it. You inspire me. And that's not really a bad thing to say, I don't guess. But I'm going to tell you that almost universally, when you say that to somebody, here's what they say. I didn't know I had a choice. I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't know that I had a choice of not going through this. I have to go through this. But I'm going to go through it trusting in God. 
I'm going to go through it counting on the God who, is, uh, who, who has got me through this far. That's why Paul says in verses 2, in verses 2 and 5, look, listen to 2, through which we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. So what is he saying? He's saying I, I, when these hard times come, I've got this grace that I can count on. Or in verse 5, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Right? I, I, I'm not looking for these things, but man, I, I have learned that I can count on God to be there and lift me through. The Old Testament lesson we read, right? Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Even young people shall fall down and get weary. But, but God will renew their strength, and they'll get through. Kate Bowler um, was a young woman. She is a young woman. She's a professor at Duke a Seminary there, teaches history, uh, uh, Christian history. And it, uh, she was diagnosed with stage 4 colon cancer in 2015. And in 2018, she wrote a book called Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved. It's an interesting book. She's so straightforward and honest and authentic in her anguish. Here's, let me just uh, uh, read to you um, what Bola writes. She's talking about the feeling of the presence of God. That feeling stayed with me for months. In fact, I had grown so accustomed to that floating feeling that I started to panic at the prospect of losing it. So I began to ask friends, theologians, historians, pastors I knew, nuns I liked, what, what am I going to do when it's gone? And they knew exactly what I meant because they had either felt it themselves or read about it in great works of Christian theology. St. Augustine called it the sweetness. Thomas Aquinas called it something mystical like the prophetic light. But all said, yes, it will go. The feelings will go. The sense of God's presence will go. But they offered me this small bit of certainty, and I clung to it. When the feelings recede like the times, they said, they will leave an imprint. I would somehow by, be marked by the presence of an unbidden God. The mark would be there. I would realize I can do things I didn't think I could do. All right, here's the second thing we learned. Kings and queens of the mountains develop courage and grit for the next mountain stage. One of our congregation gave me a great book by uh, Malcolm Gladwell called David and Goliath. You might have read it. It's, a, it's about um, powerless small people fighting against big odds, big challenges. In fact, one of the, I love one of the titles of uh, one of the sections. It's called The Theory of Desirable Difficulty, right? That if everything's easy, that's not good, right? The Theory of Desirable Difficulty. Well, the last story in the whole book is uh, the story of a man named Andre Trocme. And um, uh, after the Germans invaded France, in the Second World War, the Vichy regime was, became, was a French government that was really a puppet of uh, Hitler. And they began to round up Jews and send them to Auschwitz and concentration camps and other places. Well, in the south of France, there was a little village there, and there was a pastor in that little village uh, named André Trocme. And uh, he was a Huguenot. Now, the Huguenots were a Protestant denomination that was separate from Martin Luther and was not viewed kindly by Lutherans throughout the years. And um, they just thought, they, they just said, this is wrong. This is wrong. And so they put out the message, Jews are welcome in our village. And so they came in droves and they hid them. And then they came so many that there was no hiding them anymore. And so when the Vichy generals came to the village, they sent a letter out with some students that, uh, to give to the general that said, basically, what you're doing is wrong. We know it's wrong. We have Jews. You can't have them. 
The little school that he ran went from 18 students to 350 students. They came in such huge amounts. So he was asked, how did you do that? Well, ultimately, um, uh, the village stayed intact, but ultimately, uh, Andre was, um, he ended up having to flee and was arrested and ultimately um, was uh, uh, killed. But uh, they asked, his wife responded about why, how they were able to do it, and they said, we are Huguenots. And for hundreds of years, people have tried to exterminate us. There was a genocide uh, in the 1700s of the Huguenots. And he said, people have tried to exterminate us. So when the Jews came and asked for help, it wasn't whether, it was how. And built into who we are is the courage and grit to fight against this because of what we've been through. She said that this was powerful. She said um, Andre's, Andre's uh, father died, mother and father died when he was 10, and his son committed suicide. And so he said nothing could be, nothing could be worse than this. Anything I have now is, a, is easier. We develop this courage and grit to face whatever comes next. I joined the board of Houston Methodist Hospital when I came here to St. Luke's. I was so honored to do that. But before I came, in the year 2001, a tropical storm Allison came. Perhaps you know the, uh, the uh, story. The, the St. Luke's basement flooded, and we were without power and lost about a million dollars worth of equipment and all sorts of things. Uh, the same thing happened down at the medical center, and the basements of the hospitals flooded. Uh, Houston Methodist Hospital's basement flooded completely. Uh, they lost all power. Um, it was a, a really uh, difficult time. Were you there then? Not in 2001. So the staff um, gathered themselves together and um, carried all of the patients down flights of stairs on gurneys, doctors, nurses, med techs, custodians, everybody pitched in together to carry these patients down, to wade through the water to a place where they could get them onto ambulances, put them on ambulances and, off they, and send them to hospitals where they could go. What's so interesting is they talk about that today. As the pandemic came, they say, you remember what we did in 2001? You remember how we were able to do that? Well, we can do this. We can handle this, right? The, 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 the mountains that we go through give us courage to face the next thing, to face the next mountain stage. All right, here's the third thing we learn. Sometimes kings of the mountains crash their bikes. That happens. Uh, this, uh, there's this story which I thought was um, Powerful. Michael Woods helped create the days, this was from 2021, this year's Tour de France. Breakaway on stage 14 of the Tour de France, but his chances of victory were hampered by a crash. However, he found consolation by taking the lead in the mountains competition and pulling on the polka dot jersey. The Canadian hit the deck with 50 kilometers remaining when he slipped on a gentle left-hand bend. He took the impact on his upper left leg, which ripped his shorts and left him with road rash. Ooh, makes me shiver. Woods was leading the 14-man breakaway at the time, and, when, and while Matteo Cataneo had to swerve to avoid him, and none of the others were caught up. Woods quickly remounted and set about chasing back on, although he looked far from comfortable as the road continued to snake. So let me finish the point. Kings of the mountain sometimes crash their bikes, but they get back on. We've been talking about perseverance, but this is a corollary to perseverance. This is resilience, right? That when bad things happen, we get back about the business of doing what we need to do. Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians. But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that the extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, 
persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. We'll get back on the bike. I must say that as I was writing this sermon, it was midweek, and I was watching the Astros. And I was thinking to myself, oh no, um, we are really bad now. What happened to us? We really stink. Um, we have no pitching whatsoever. I was, I was like, well, at least I won't have to watch the World Series next week. Uh, I mean, we don't have to move any of our meetings around to avoid the World Series because we won't be in it. Uh, but. There you go. They got back on the bike. I mean, these pitchers prove resilience, do they not? I even got my Astro socks on. That's how, how we're ready. So we're ready for it. Now, listen, uh, I'm going to spare you the stories about Abraham Lincoln losing like 10 elections before he got elected president. And I'm going to spare you the stories about Michael Jordan not making his varsity basketball team. But I am going to tell you some stories. I'm going to tell you a story of a family, a couple who went through extramarital affair and wondered if they could ever be a family again, but worked to build trust. Over a period of years, it's not a magic, oh, you're forgiven, let's move on, but worked to build trust and worked and worked at what the problems in their marriage were and now have been married for over 40 years. And I am going to tell you a story about a woman whose husband died and her heart was broken. And she thought she would never love again, but in fact fell in love again and is happily married. And I, and I am going to tell you a story about a man who lost his job three times during the, during the difficult years in the energy business, but then got the job that he loved more than anything. And is like, I, I can't believe this is where I've landed. I am going to tell you the story about my friend who has battled alcoholism and would stay sober for three months and then fall off the wagon and stay sober for three months and fall off the wagon and stay sober for three months and fall off the wagon and get more and more full of despair. But now, it's been sober 20 years. Resilience. All right, the last thing is this. Kings and queens of the mountains know that Paris is at the end of the race. Right? That's what's there at the end. So I think it's amazing. The last stage of the race is pretty much ceremonial. Now, there are some sprint races that happen, but for the mo time trials in the midst of it, but for the most part, it's a ceremonial race. And the tradition is that whoever has the yellow jersey going into it, they, you don't pass in that person. And in fact, the team of the yellow jersey wearer serves champagne to the entire uh, group before the race, right? So you see all these people riding into Paris with champagne. I mean, it doesn't seem very uh, athletic, right? And uh, then they make uh, uh, eight laps around the Champs Elysees. You know what that means? It means Elysian fields. It's the Greek understanding of heaven, of, of paradise. You see, we know that at the end of the race, we have the hope of sharing in the glory of God. That God has promised that God is going to recreate the world, that is going to renew the world, and that, that everything that's broken will be fixed, and justice will be done, and everything that's dead will become alive, and that the forces of love and of life will triumph over the forces of hate and death. And it will be made right. And we have that hope that that's what's at the end of the race. So I ask you simply to close your eyes and listen. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 
And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them and they shall be his people. And God himself will be with them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Neither will there be mourning or crying or pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And the one who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Gracious and loving God, we know that the hard times come, some more than others, for some of us more than others, some mountains bigger than others, but we know that the mountains will come. We would pray, God, that you would just give us the strength to get through them and teach us that we can do more than we thought we could. That we would develop the courage and grit to, whatever, to, to face whatever is next on the mountain stage. That indeed, God, when we crash our bikes, we would just get up and get back on. And above all, God, keep that hope alive within us. Our hope of sharing in the glory of God on that day. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.